in our last set of notes, we looked at how to write formulas for chemical compounds. But this time, let's go backwards. Let's look at how we actually name those chemical compounds once we know their formula. Now, again, I could read these rules, but I would rather start working these examples and using the rules as we go. I think they'll make more sense. So let's look at the first example here. When we write the name for these compounds, the first thing we want to do is to just simply write down the first element, which is calcium. Now, if you remember, positive ions, always the positive ones are first in a chemical name for a binary ionic compound. Um, when we have a calcium ion or any kind of positive ion, we need to decide whether it's got a Roman numeral or not. And we're going to look at how we make that determination here in a moment. But when we name the last element, sulfur in this case, we want to name that with the ion name for it. And if you remember, sulfur's ending name or ion name is sulfide. So now what we want to do is to decide whether calcium needs a Roman numeral. If it's a known charge, we don't have to write a Roman numeral for it. If, however, it's a transition metal, or what I call it, looking, it being in that sea of unknown charges, then we do need a Roman numeral. Now let's look at the periodic table where I've kind of drawn this. It's kind of funky looking here, but I think it would will really explain how you figure out whether something needs a Roman numeral or not. We've got these items here, these elements here that are in red, and those ones that are in red do not need Roman numerals. They are known charges, plus one and plus two, as I set up here. Over here, we also have a few red ones in the middle. These red ones here are also known charges. Those are the ones I call the always trues. And we know that silver is always a plus one when it's in an ion form. Cadmium zinc are always plus two, and aluminum is always a plus three. So that's going to give us just these little islands in the sea of unknown charge. Now, everything else in this starred area here, everything else is going to be an unknown charge. We don't know what that charge is, and since we don't, the only way to indicate that in the formula name is to give a Roman numeral for it. So as you notice up here, it says that if it has a star, it's going to, or it's in that starred area, that sea of unknown charge, it's going to need a Roman numeral. Now our smiley face elements over here, boron and silicon are kind of exceptions to the rule, so they're just not going to really follow some of the stuff that we're talking about. But for the most part, the rest of those elements inside those smiley faces are simply going to be um, the elements that are at the end of a binary compound name, and we're going to change those elements to IDE. So that's how you read this table. And if you look at where calcium is, calcium is over here, number 20. It's in the known charge area, therefore it does not need Roman numerals. So calcium sulfide is the name for CAS. Let's look at ALF3. We know it's got aluminum, and we know it's got fluorine. Now, remember, fluorine's at the end, so it's going to get its ending name, which is fluoride. We always have to check to see if that first element needs a Roman numeral. When we go back to our chart and we see that aluminum is over here, number 13, right here, and aluminum is, although it looks like it's in the middle of that sea of unknown charge, is actually one of the red blocked elements. We know it's charged. We know it's always going to be a plus three. Therefore, as we said before, those red ones do not need Roman numerals, so we're going to simply leave it as aluminum fluoride. Notice something that people do all the time. I always see people write aluminum trifluoride. Remember, if it is a molecular compound, we use prefixes. But in all of these ionic compounds that we're dealing with now, we never put prefixes with those element, element names. Okay, so look at the next example, CUBR. 
We know it's got copper. Bromine's ending name is bromide. And we look up copper in our periodic table, and we see that copper is over here. It is in the sea of unknown charge. It's not one of the red blocked elements, so since it is in that sea of unknown positive charge, we know that copper is going to need a Roman numeral. So how do we figure out what that Roman numeral is? We don't know copper's charge, but if you get back, get out your periodic table that has all those charges listed, you'll see that bromine is in the negative one column. Look at the top of the column, you'll see that negative one. We've talked about this rule before. We know that compounds must add up to zero for their charge. So if bromine is a negative one, then copper, in order for it to add up to zero, must be a positive one. So that's going to be our Roman numeral for copper. We always want the charge on just one of those first elements. So let the, look at the next one. We know that this has copper and this time oxygen. So ending name for oxygen is oxide. We've already established in the previous problem that copper needs a Roman numeral. We just need to figure out what it is. Be careful. It's very big tendency to put how many coppers are in the compound rather than looking for the charge. So let's see how that plays out in this one. If we look up oxygen on the periodic table, we'll see it's in the negative 2 column. Since this compound has to equal out to zero and oxygen is a negative two, that means copper has to be a positive two. There's only one copper. It's responsible for all of that charge. So its charge is positive two. Guys, remember that has to be the Roman numeral for that compound name. The Roman numeral is the charge, not the number of those elements. The number of the atoms has nothing to do with the Roman numeral. If it happens to be the same, it's a coincidence. So look at the next one. We know it has silver, and we know it has sulfur in it. Ending name for sulfur, we've already established, is sulfide. Without looking, we might think that silver is a transition metal. We might kind of know where it is now. But when we look at the periodic table, yes, it is a transition metal, but it's, in, it's a red blocked transition metal. We know that the charge on silver is always plus one. So red ones don't get Roman numerals. So it's simply silver sulfide. The next one we can do a little bit of a shortcut on if we want to. We know that this has iron, and if you look at the periodic table, you'll see that iron is in that sea of unknown charge, so it's going to need a Roman numeral. And then oxygen's ending name is oxide. So now we can do what we've done before. Remember when we were writing formulas, we had a little bit of a shortcut. We said that we could cross charges, which meant that these subscripts the end subscript was the charge on the first element, and the subscript on the first element was the charge on the second element. So what does that mean? That means iron's charge is a plus 3, or 3 plus, and oxygen's, as we've already established in previous problems, is a negative 2. Crossing charges. The charge on iron is what we need, so that's what's going to go in here in the parentheses. Now, we could do this a long way. We could say, okay, we know it's Fe2O3. We know that oxygen has a negative 2 charge. Since there are three oxygens, think about it. That would be a total of six negatives, right? And if this has to equal out to zero, that means iron's total charge would have to be positive 6 because iron's responsible for that positive charge. But there are two irons in this compound. And if two irons are responsible for six positives, evidently one iron is responsible for only three positive charges. So that, once again, is another way that you can come up with that three for the Roman numeral. Crossing charges is just a little bit of a shortcut.
Now that crossing charges, remember, works for both 2-3 and 3-4 combinations. So do the next one yourself real quick. Hopefully you came up with crossing charges as being 10, 4, Roman numeral 4, IV, phosphide. 10, 4, phosphide. 10 needs a Roman numeral because it's in that sea of unknown charge. Watch it, you'll be going to town with that 2, 3, 3, 4 co combination little trick and you'll get to zinc and you'll try to do the same thing. Look at where zinc is. Zinc is right here in one of the red blocks. It's an always true. It does not get a Roman numeral. So this one is going to be simply zinc nitride. So watch for those. Now what if it has a polyatomic ion in it? The very first thing that I always ask you to do when it has a polyatomic ion in it is to circle it. And if it's not in parentheses, that means there's only one of that polyatomic ion. So do yourself a favor and put a one after that if it's not in parentheses. Here's another polyatomic ion. There's only one of them. Here's iron, I, actually iron with nitrate, nitrates, polyatomic ion. I'm not going to put a one after because this particular one is in parentheses. It tells me that there are three nitrate polyatomic ions in this compound. And finally, in this last example, we have two phosphates in that compound. So that's going to be important when we start to name this. We do the naming part just the same as we do for a binary compound, but in this case, we have to make sure that we don't change the ending of a polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions don't change in their endings. If we changed sulfate to sulfide, it wouldn't have oxygen in, in, the, in it anymore. It would simply be an S. So we want to make sure that we keep those polyatomic ion names unchanged. Do not change them. Calcium, remember, is in group 2A. It's one of the red block elements, so it does not have a Roman numeral. So we're going to leave it alone. It's simply calcium sulfate. Our next example, NH4, hopefully you're learning your polyatomic ions, is ammonium. Polyatomic ions never get Roman numerals, so don't put a Roman numeral with this. We're simply going to put down the na ending name for the final element, and that's chloride. Now what about in the next instance when we have iron, and we've already established in a previous problem that iron's in that sea of unknown charge, so it's going to need a Roman numeral. NO3 is nitrate. The reason I circled it is because I wanted you to look up the charge on nitrate. Nitrate, if you don't know it already, is a negative one. Since there are three nitrates, that means we've got a total negative three charge here. Still has to add up to zero. So what does iron's charge have to be? A plus three. And remember, that charge on iron is what we need to put into our parentheses for our Roman numeral. So Roman numeral three here. Iron three nitrate. The last example for our ionic compounds is copper with PO4. Hopefully you remember that PO4 is phosphate. We established earlier that copper is in the sea of unknown charge, so it's going to need a Roman numeral. And look what we have here. We have a 3-2 combination. So that 3-2 combination is going to allow us to cross charges. So let's look at what we've got here. That 2 becomes the charge on copper. The 3 becomes the charge on phosphate. And looks like we've got a Roman numeral 2 for our, for our parentheses for that particular compound, copper 2 phosphate. Be careful. The way that was written, written originally, um, we need to watch to make sure that we don't try to put in and assume that this is, well, this one's not even the um, best of examples, but 
let's say that we're dealing with that calcium sulfate, we need to make sure and realize that if we have sulfate, that is not four sulfates. That's why I had you circle it. That's only one sulfate. So be careful that you don't fall into that trap when you're trying to cross charges sometimes with these elements. Okay, the very last ones are the easiest ones to do. These are the molecular compounds. Easy rules to follow. We need to know our prefixes, remember. Mono, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nana, and deca. Make sure you know your prefixes. The first element is named with a prefix only if there's more than one. Never start with mono. Now, our second element can have mono if there's only one of them, but never start the compound name with mono. We simply just name it. For instance, look at this first example. Since there's only one carbon here, we don't say monocarbon. We simply say carbon. But since there are four bromine ions, we're going to, or bromine atoms, we're going to name this with the prefix tetra tetra bromide be careful that you do not change the ending of the first element that you only change the ending of the second one look at the next one since there are two nitrogens we do need a prefix now dinitrogen don't end don't change the ending of the first element this last part of the name pentaoxide what they do with a's and o's is to blend them into just writing an O. Oh, they drop the A, pentoxide. I wouldn't count it wrong if you put pentaoxide, but try to remember that that A drops out and they blend it and make it pentoxide. The next one, dichlorine. One of the most common things I get is people putting dichloride. I'm going to be real picky about those endings and grade hard on that, so make sure you're ending it correctly. The um, prefix for seven is hepta. Again, we've got heptaoxide. We're going to drop the A and just write heptoxide. Finally, the last one, since there's no, there's only one nitrogen, are we going to start that with mono? Nope, not, a, not for the first element. It's simply nitrogen. But the second element does have um, have to have a prefix, and since there's only one of them, now we do monoxide. Monoxide, again, they blend it, drop one of the O's, and simply write monoxide. That's not an unfamiliar term. We hear carbon monoxide all the time.